The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. For them to, to do it. Um, the other thing I would say is kudos to Cloudflare. They have a blog post on this whole attack. Um, they've been very open about it, which is very refreshing because a lot of people just prefer to shove it under the table if they can, and that doesn't really help the rest of us learn how these things occur. So, you know, for us, uh, what we've focused on is driving down the costs of two-factor authentication. I mean, we've got an open source version. I think it looks better than that. Ease of use is a big one. What we find is, is that um, people that like People like Linux and in security tend to like to have control, and so they don't want to outsource the, um, the keys to the kingdom. We also like to explore the trade-offs between security and usability, because one of the, the reasons why passwords still work is because they're so usable for the end user. And if we can make them, if we can make a system that's easy enough for the end user to use uh, as a password, that would be an incredibly powerful situation. So I'm gonna, um, so this is all new material for me. I spent some time with CloudStack and some of the other systems, and what I want to bring here is kind of a, a broad brush look at how we um, how authentication is treated, some of the some of the key points where you should lock it down, and then how to do that. So, yeah, one thing I noticed was that if you look at all of the um, uh, CloudStack managers, there's 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 a consistent message. So I spent the most time with CloudStack, um, mostly alphabetically, but I appreciate their sponsorship of the room today and of Self. Um, how about Self? Is this who's uh, who's uh, been to Self before? Who's um, the new people? Did you come because it was in Charlotte, or did you just hear about it? Would you have gone to Spark Spartanburg? If you're if it's, if it is your first year, did you did you just find out about it this year, or did you come because of the new location? I think this is my um, third, maybe, time speaking. So um, it's a good show. All right, so I spent a lot of time with CloudStack, and out of the box, they support an MD5 hashed password and um, an LDAP to talk to Active Directory. Uh, to customize it, they have, um, you basically take their MD5 jar file and override it. Okay, so we actually did that, and we uh, created a wicked user authenticator jar for CloudStack. So you can log into uh, CloudStack with Wicked. And it was pretty easy to do. You basically, you know, you write the jar, build the jar, and then in the components.xml file, you tell it to use that jar. Um, for the Wicked network client, uh, to use our API, it needs to know which Wicked server to talk to. So you tell the IP address, the port. Any Wicked network client um, needs a P12 file to talk to the Wicked server. So we do client-based SSL and um, a domain. And I'll go through some more of the Wicked stuff later on when I um, talk about that side of it. Um, you have to turn off the MD5 hashing on the user interface. And that's really it on the CloudStack side. So integration with CloudStack was pretty easy for us. For, on the Wicked side, so just so you know, so Wicked, um, you know, users, groups are, um, you, know, you can group users and return different radius attributes on that. Uh, domains is where we keep the users and certain security parameters, and it's how the tokens actually find the server, right? So our tokens actually talk to the server, and that's via zero padded IP address, right? Um, pin length, passcode lifetime, max bad pen attempts, max bad passcode attempts are all admin configurable by domain. So then you create a network client for the cloud stack server and um, tell it its IP address, and you create that certificate that we saw. And that's really all you need. From then on, the users can use a Wicked token, they generate, they, they type in their PIN, they get back a one-time passcode, and they can log into the Cloud Stack Administrator with uh, Wicked two-factor authentication. That's the only one we really had time for, but we looked at the OpenStack stuff and their Keystone API, 
and that also looks pretty um, easily extendable. You know, they've got examples for PAM and a couple other options. They also have built-in support for LDAP and Active Directory. So I think we're seeing a theme here. Um, Eucalyptus, um, I talked to um, uh, some of the Eucalyptus guys online and Adam today, who I think is speaking later. They support LDAP and Active Directory. Um, and they support basically the EC2 API. So part of their thing is that they are really um, helping you work with EC2. And so they're, they're kind of limited in their options. So I haven't quite figured out whether you, it's possible for you to use a different authentication mechanism than what Amazon provides, which could be a question. I mean, I think that's uh, it, probably one of those things where if you're using Eucalyptus, you're in bed with Amazon and you're going that way. OpenStack and CloudStack appear to be more like if you're doing a private cloud infrastructure and um, may want to keep more stuff at home. So that's the stack managers. Um, the other key piece here is host authentication, right? So if you've got a, um, and this also applies to actually the CloudStack server at the OS level and the hypervisor server at the OS level, but if you've got hosts that are running in virtual environments, how do you do authentication to those? So for Linux, this means PAM, the pluggable authentication module. And for Windows, it means something else, <laughs> uh, which typically would be um, RDP or VNC. The, the trick here is to look at FreeNX, um, which is a, um, you know, a remote access tool that's pretty cool. It's extremely fast. So we'll uh, delve into this. And this is uh, PAM. How many of y'all have played with PAM and understand how it works? or have played with Pam and got it to work. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of the way it is, right? Hey, it's working, now copy it everywhere. Don't touch anything. Um, it's, it is really, and each, and each OS flavor does it a little bit differently, which is also kind of annoying. Um, but once you get it, you get so much. Everything, um, you know, SSH, sudo, login, all of the key um, processes in Linux to use Pam. And I've had uh, PostgreSQL will support Pam, right? So if you think about those attackers, who get on your box and then want to get into Postgres, you know, that's a, a key lockdown area. Um, I've set up a Jabber IM server that supported PAM, um, just as a, a proof of concept. Um, so for PAM Radius, uh, which, yeah, now I'm gonna start talking a lot about Radius. Um, Radius is a great protocol. It is for your LAN, right? It's only encoded, it's not encrypted, but uh, it is a, it's a really, standard standard, which is really nice. And all you need to set it up pretty much is an IP address and a shared secret. Right? So in your um, configuration file, which is Etsy RadDB server, although it might have moved recently to Etsy radius.conf, and it might again depend on your OS flavor, you tell it where the server IP where the server is and the shared secret. Then in your service file, for example, SSHD, which in entirely looks like this, you tell it that it can use Radius for authentication. Note that you still have to do system auth somehow, which could be a, an account on the box or via LDAP. Um, so what I would recommend, you know, and again, this depends on your deployment and what you're trying to do, but what I recommend to people is they use an SSH gateway box that is locked down with two-factor authentication, and from there you perform commands across all your hosts or across, uh, or have, S have um, SSH keys to get in. So why would you, if you have SSH keys, also need a one-time password? Yes, but I, many would argue that having the SSH key is two-factor, if it's protected by a password. So the, a the answer is compliance. Because for compliance, you might need to prove how long that password is. You might need, to, maybe, might need to be able to regen keys, you know, and so you've got all those issues, which SSH is a great product, but even though the newer versions now can um, require a client to have a password on their key, you don't know that someone just didn't recompile, you know, the program <laughs> to say it has a password. So there's compliance issues around that. The other thing that I like to point out is that from a um, enterprise standpoint, uh, it's good to have all the puppies in, in a box, right? Which means that you've got all your authentication and authorization going through one process. So if you've got an assistant who's got SSH keys 
and LAN access through LDAP or Active Directory and whatever else, it's good to have that all through one process. And, Pam and Radius will do that, which we'll, we'll dig into. Um, and if you want to be paranoid, because sudo is a separate process, you can have sudo require a one-time passcode. I just love the flexibility of Linux. Um, the other way to lock down a virtual environment would be at the network le layer. It could be on your, you know, how to get into your network, or it could be on the virtual network. And um, again, Radius is quite simple for this. You know, with PFSense, uh, all you need to do is, you know, tell it to use Radius IP address and server. With the OpenVPN AS server, the commercial version, again, it's web interface, IP address, shared secret. With the, with the um, community version, you need to create a service file for OpenVPN. It would literally probably just have that one line, the authentication line in it, and tell the client to prompt for a username and password. And on the server side, tell it to use the um, PAM authentication module and point it to the service file you created in step one. The, how many people use OpenVPN? Yeah, it's, a, it's a very good product. The interesting thing about this setup is that if you're using a separate authentication me mechanism, you don't have to do individual search for each user because the search are only doing um, encryption. So it makes your deployment a little bit easier because certs are a pain. Um, so remote desktop, you know, we have, we have one customer that's using, uh, you know, they've got pretty much Linux everywhere except for their credit card processing boxes, which are in, <laughs> which are in Windows. So they virtualize them and then access them via FreeNX. Um, FreeNX, NX is, a, is the protocol. No Machine is the company that created it. They also have a commercial version. FreeNX is a little bit long in the tooth in terms of the package, uh, you know, bug fixes. There's a couple of new, um, projects out there, TACX and NEEDX, which is actually backed by Google, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's a very powerful program. You get RemoteX, VNC, RDP. Um, it's all tunneled through SSH. So there's a client you download from No Machine, tunnels everything through SSH. The server on that side does authentication via PAM and then routes out the VNC and RDP traffic. It is actually, I think, faster than doing unencrypted VNC. So it's quite, and it's ah, so much, I mean, who's, have you ever tried to set up VNC through SSH? It's just god awful. Um, this is a very clean um, and easy to use process, very fast. All right, so that's the host, that's the uh, stack managers. The third piece may be, depending on your needs, the application, and I'm not talking about Angry Birds. Typically what you're seeing, I think, these days is gonna be some type of web application. And, you know, we have, we do have an API, we've got packages for um, Python, Java, PHP, Ruby, and C Sharp. So if you want to embed um, two-factor authentication into your application, those are LGPL packages. So for, have at it. Um, but Apache is, if you can, if you can, you know, Apache is so flexible and so powerful that this is a great way to set things up. And with it, you get all your, um, your web apps, if they support HP Auth, CMSs, web mail, WordPress, all that stuff. So how does that look? Um, on Ubuntu, you can actually app get install the, lib, the uh, libradius package. In the HTTP comp file, again, you give it the server IP address and the shared secret. You have to set a cookie. Um, if you don't, your, you know, if you've got, for each request, you go and hit the one-time password server, that one-time password server is gonna fail after one time. So um, you do need the cookie. Then you can protect any section, any uh, location, location match, directory, virtual server with Radius. And so that's a very easy way to add two-factor authentication to any web app. Um, for example, your WordPress admin. You know, you might not want to press your, you know, might want to lock, you might not want to lock down your WordPress site, but your admin you may want to lock down. And you can do that by pr protecting that area and I think from login PHP site. Okay, so where are we? What does it look like? So, as I've noted, all of the Cloud Stack Manager software packages are supporting L Active Directory. Why is that? Because everybody, you know, not everybody, not everybody in this conference, but most of the world has their users in Active Directory. And, but what does it end up looking like? You know, okay, well we can do WAuth here, we can do LDAP here, we can do Radius here, but there's, there's kind of a gap, right? And um, if you're in an enterprise deployment, you wanna fix that. Um, 
Why? Um, usually, this, it's a security feature, right? Um, you want to be able to disable a user in one place and have the right person do that and have it be effective everywhere. Um, and uh, it also allows you to, you know, replace the parts more easily. You can start off with, a, with like, probably the, the highest end, <laughs> the highest end net gear box, which is a pretty low piece of crap, will support radius and allow you to set this up. You can then switch into PFSense, a Cisco, whatever else. All you're doing is going in, setting up, and saying, okay, talk radius to this, and it's done. You can switch from, um, you know, a, uh, whatever type of authentication server you want. You can do more than one authentication server, right? So you can have a certain group of users that go to an RSA server, a certain group that go to Wicked. You can have a certain group that stop and just do passwords, and another group that goes in and, do, and does two-factor. Um, I also like the concept that you can have a, PFC, a PFSense BSD-based firewall talking to Windows, talking to Linux, all via standard protocol. I mean, who would have thought? Um, so that's kind of what it looks like if you're using Radius. You can't really do this with LDAP or Kerberos. And, um, and it's really not that bad to set up, uh, except if you're using Windows. <laughs> that's where it gets complex. So I'll step you through this. This is a little bit, I have a page on this on our website um, on how to set up, this is NPS. This is the Windows Radius plugin, the network policy server. And um, it's, it's funny, you know, we do a lot of pre-sales engineering, and, but almost all of the discussions are around, yeah, okay, so I've got the Wicked server set up. Now, how do I get it to talk to my Cisco box? How do I get it to talk to my, you know, how do I do this? And so we're always doing support for Juniper and Cisco. And, and if, when people get testy with me, I'm like, well, why don't you go to Pound Microsoft and see, and see how their uh, you know, IRC support is. Um, usually keep it so. so again, what we're doing is we're gonna set up the, uh, this is the Radius client, right? So your VPN, your Cloud Stack Manager, your web app would be the client. Um, you give it the shared secret. Then you go in and create a server. This would be the Wicked server or your two-factor authentication server. You give it a shared secret. Um, some of these things, like the you know the uh, authenticator um, attribute and things like that, can be specific to each um, two-factor authentication server. Um, then you create a re uh, connection request policy. All right. So basically, what we're going to say is that everything that comes in um, on that IP address should go to the Wicked server, and that's kind of it. So you can also specify it via incoming IP address, right? So you can have everybody that's going into a um, the hypervisor host needs to have two-factor authentication. Everyone who's logging into the web app just needs, a, just needs an Active Directory um, uh, credit, uh, credentials. And yes, of course, you can do this with free radius and LDAP, uh, open LDAP as well. It's, you know, it's doable. It's not, it's not excessively complex. But. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about single sign-on. You know, we do have a number of, of, um, of customers, not necessarily doing single sign-on so much, but doing um, Google Apps and Salesforce. And uh, we support Google Apps out of the box. We don't support Salesforce out of the box, but um, this is an interesting thing. How is any, are y'all, are there any CloudStack or OpenStack developers here or people from those companies? Are you, so you, <laughs> contributors? So y'all, are y'all, y'all are enterprise people, you would be deploying this stuff, you're looking at deploying it? Okay. So um, this is a project called JASO, the Java Open Source Single Sign-On uh, Project. It's from a company called Atracore. Um, I, this is, I looked at a lot of these, um, well, I looked at a couple, and I looked at three or four of these guys. There's another one called OpenAM that used to be the Sun product. Um, the two that I was able to do were two of the more simple ones to, to uh, set up. Um, JASO is pretty cool. You basically can um, all, in this graphic interface, go in and, um, design out your identi identity system. They have support for, could I just let them go extra loud? Um, they have support for uh, the Wicked open source version, so they're using our WF API. You drop a little Wicked icon in there, click on it, and uh, give it the uh, same parameters as, as in the cloud stack example, the certificate, the passphrase, the IP address, and it will route all the authentication through to Wicked. Then you drop in, like a, in this example, I just use a Tomcat connector. Drop that in and, um, and set it up and, and it's good to go. And then you hit publish and it spits out all the code, which is pretty cool. I mean, the other one that I looked at was uh, CAS, um, 
which is kind of a Maven-based Java um, system. It builds out WAR files. You, you go in and you basically say, okay, I want to build it with radius, and here are my radius parameters. Um, and so from that standpoint, you can get any, any, any Cassified application, which you know, includes Tomcat, JBoss, all that other stuff, can um, route authentications through radius. So that is, I thought that was worth discussing about. Okay, so to wrap up, we are early. Um, you know, I think, the, I think the key thing to think about is risk management. Um, when you look at how the attacks occur, how they start in one place and head to the other, um, I guess there's, there's sort of two things. One is you gotta lock down from the script kiddies, which means, the, you know, the blocking and tackling of changing the default credentials, um, making sure that users are using strong passwords. But if it's gonna be a determined attacker, they're gonna get in. They're gonna, they're gonna find some way to get in. You need to make sure they can't actually do damage before you catch them. And I think that's where two-factor authentication can really play a role. Um, you know, that may be your cloud stack manager, which certainly if you're, you know, if you're, <laughs> which is a high risk area in terms of them being able to get all your information and uh, control your systems. It could be those, uh, the hypervisor host, the cloud stack manager host. It could actually be the virtual machines. And, um, you know, then think about the roles too. Is it just a user? Is it a root? Um, you know, what's the, what's the authorization that they have uh, and how important is that to your enterprise? Um, you know, two-factor authentication, I mean, I think historically people think of it as just an expensive hassle. And I think that's rapidly changing. Um, whether you're gonna use a service that, you know, you know sends you passcodes or you're gonna do something where you deploy it yourself, it's really not that bad. So I think that's about it. Are there, hopefully there'll be some questions, otherwise we can all go and hit the booth. <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, so, um, uh, so the, the question is about duo, duo security. Um, and, um, you know, they are, uh, it's, an, it's an interesting product. It's, it's a service, right? You, you get their, um, um, you get a plug-in from them, right? And um, it sits on your network. Your users contact them. Um, they support, you know, the, I think one thing is that they support, like, dialback. SMS, yeah. as well as software tokens. So there's a couple things. One is, um, you know, you're relying on them as a service, and that may or you know that may be that may be more secure than what you could provide yourself. And I think this is the, where people, you know, people in information security is like, oh, it's on the cloud, and it's never, you know, it's never going to be secure. And they're, but they're often in their bubble of information security at large companies, or they're, you know, they're the um, industry analysts. And if you're gonna hire an industry analyst, you're already in a different market, right? <laughs> so, you know, for most people, you know, you, most, most you know, this is a Linux conference, most Windows admin cannot secure an Exchange server, right? And, um, you know, they should be on Google Apps. You know, it's, um, um, and so, so at, running it as a, as, as a service may make risk management sense for your enterprise. Um, what, what I don't understand, I guess, from their standpoint is, you know, what, what control do you have over user enablement and disablement? Um, what's, the recess, what's the reset process? You know, how are they gonna get attacked? You know, who would have thought that Google's two-factor authentication would be success, successfully attacked, right? I mean, Google does it pretty well. Um, I would also say, I think that a lot of those services uh, have a, you know, it's kind of like back in the days when you didn't have unlimited data and you went over it and all of a sudden, you know, it's like you've been making international calls um, because they start off as being, you know, three bucks a month and, but when you go over a certain number of authentications or dial-ins or dial-backs or SMS text messages, it hits you up. So with Wicked, our pricing is very simple. It's, um, it starts at, um, uh, $24 per user per year. We've got a 10-seat a 10 minimum, so it's 240 bucks. I think they start out as 10 free or five free and then go to three bucks a month. 
So it, it may just depend on where your user base is. Uh, those guys, are, you know, the, the interesting story about that, you see, did you see that their app was taken down from the um, Android market? So they did a, they did a I, I sort of looked at the video, but I was kind of working on this presentation about something called uh, Doorbuster or something like that that was a way to try and um, break the security of the Android market. So they were, they were actually kicked out of the developer program, but they got $5 million in venture funding from Google. So, <laughs> um, you know, I like those guys. They're pretty funny. We ran, an ad, a re, we ran an ad on Reddit in NetSec, and one of them hopped in and says, hey, you know, plug for Duo. And I'm like, okay, well, next time you run an ad, I'm going to do a plug for Wicked. And he's like, that's cool. <laughs> um, but there are, you know, it's the same with Phone Factor. It's a service. You know, it really depends on your risk management tolerance and what you want to do and whether you want um, the keys to the kingdom at home or whether you're more comfortable having them out there. Um, yes. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, our server would sit behind a PFSense firewall, and essentially what the traffic flow would be, you know, our tokens actually use port 80, right? So we're, we're using asymmetric encryption, so we don't need 443. So that token traffic needs to go to the server. Everything else would be internal, and we've got customers that have, that have set up um, Wicked, to have set up PFSense to talk to Wicked, and... Um, Okay, yeah. Um, well, that's a good question. I don't know about that specifically. Um, how is authentication done in PF? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, what I would say is that I think, I mean, I would say it's doable. I mean, there's really, you know, in BSD and Linux, it's, everything is doable. I think it's just a matter of what the uh, configuration options are. Well, we support Radius and LDAP and TACAX. Um, and, you know, we rarely see TACAX. It's, it's usually only for people that have a lot of Cisco switches in their environment and need to do authorization embedded with authentication. Um, Radius is just really simple and gets you that directory integration and proxying. So that's typically what we see. But there's no reason if, um, you know, particularly for smaller organizations or organizations where there's enough automation where you can maybe, you know, you can, you can design a system to kill a user here, here, and here if you have the discipline to use it and, um, and it works, you know, out of, out of the box. So it could be that you have, um, you know, SSH to here and then two factor there. I, I think I think it's doable. I just don't know enough about PF to make to, to make a decision or a recommendation. Right. I would think. If, I mean, if it's a, I, I can't imagine it, it wouldn't work. To, and you're concerned about the files being, you're concerned about authentication. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the question is around sort of a shared working space that it. Secured ad hoc sharing. Um, how do they do it now? They don't. Okay. Okay. So there's, there's no no ad hoc sharing right now. Um, I don't know anything about that. So the the question would be is what application you would use that would work. I mean, I, I could think of that would be a pretty simple uh, content management system. Um, and um, you know, like we use Clone on our web server, and um, 
it has a lot of uh, functionality, and we've, we have a Plone plug-in too, um, but it also supports HTTP auth. So you could easily do two-factor authentication and then just choose the right content management system to allow users to easily drop in and share content and files. Um, and you know, just delete it all at the end. So the the paper that has been written more than six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of it's sort of really two things, right? It, it's the um, and I guess the response is about Shibboleth, and Shibboleth to me seems to be a um, you know it's a single sign-on type of application that handles the authorization and the authentication, right? Um, when you do that, is the Shibboleth at your location, or are these people coming from? Or is it are you tapping back into the university over there? Entities, yes. Uh huh. Yes. Okay. So Shibboleth is is something that will do that entity to entity um, trust model, but you still have to to um, to uh, provision the users. So I, I don't know the I don't necessarily know the answer to that. I can tell you what we what we have the capability of doing is via our API. Um, it, the multi-tenancy, the concept of multi-tenancy is built in. So you can you can put up you can pop up a little web app that has our um, our API and has a um, the P12 file to trust the relationship back to the Wicked server. That could be at University A, and University A could protect that um, or have an admin run that or protect it via their Active Directory credentials. And so they could say, okay, every you know every Everyone who's going to be involved in Project B, register your Wicked token here, and um, they would get their two-factor authentication set up there to log in over here. At the end of the project, you can kill that certificate, and they're all gone. Um, does that make sense? So it pushes control of the users and user provisioning down to where the users live. But you maintain control of the entire relationship, and also you maintain control of the users here at the Wicked server level. Yeah, um, uh, we have. So all, first of all, all of our pricing is online. I hate it when you go someplace and it's like, call, you know, free up to here, and then call salespeople. You know, who wants to do that? So all of our pricing is online. Um, our first pr price break is like at 500 users, and then it just drops down. Um, and you know we're very so here's if you have if you come to me and say hey these guys are cheaper than you and I'll evaluate it I will lower everyone's price. I don't we don't give any special deals. It always amazes people like I, we have to call you and talk to you eight times to see if we can get a lower price. How does that lower my cost? <laughs> so um, we we're pretty uh, staunch about that, but very open on pricing. And it drops down to I don't know. I don't know how low it goes. We haven't reached that level yet. We actually have, I was talking to someone about, um, you know, they have a freemium model for their cloud application, and, um, you know, I know they, they can go get our open source solution and set it up and run it for free. Um, so I want to upsell them, and we're like, maybe we could do an, an unlimited license. You know, you pay us so much per month, and you just get it. You use the same seat license, right? So, they, so you would have a Wicked server, and you would have 100 seats, and no matter who the people are, we don't care. Um, and um, you know, we don't have a concept of session or anything like that, because that's always at the firewall or, or app. But it's just seat licenses, and um, it, it, that, we get that a lot, where people, people that use a lot of contractors, because getting the hardware back from contractors is impossible. Um, so we see that a lot. The other thing is you can have multiple, each user can have multiple tokens. So you can have one on your PC and one on your iPhone and one on your iPad 
And that's what we find is the, that's the, that's the, the, the C-suite solution, is you just give them tokens everywhere so they never have to be without. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's a, another good question. Anything else? Well, good, our questions kind of brought us up to sort of where we need to be. I'm in a booth over there. If you want a cocktail shaker, you probably will get one today because I'm running low. Um, I'll also be in the bar tomorrow night watching the Belmont. Um, so come see me there. Thanks very much. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You'll have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale number two it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.
When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Astris. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Astris, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astrospace systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astris or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astris. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.